Hello, uh, this is the Translators of Agoscopy instructional course. My name is uh, George Garras. I'm a head and neck fellow at uh, Andrew University Hospital, and my co presenter is Mr. Maganka Day, consultant head and neck surgeon at Birmingham University Hospital. So let's look at uh, the different sections of the course first of all. Uh, initially, we will uh, discuss the physiology of the upper digestive tract followed by the pathology. And uh, I'm referring to that, we are referring to that as dual pathology in terms of the fact that uh, it's both the pharynx and larynx, but also the distal esophagus and beyond, as you will see. Uh, we will then discuss about the role of transnasal esophagoscopy in modern ENT practice and briefly touch on the evidence base of TNO. As this uh, is meant to be a practical course, uh, the evidence covering will be brief just to give an illustration, especially as there is a separate uh, uh, TNO instructional course by other colleagues who will cover uh, recent literature. We will then uh, look at the future directions and uh, the bulk of the course and when I want to focus at uh, it relates to the technique of TNO. Uh, initially, as you know, this course uh, was meant to be a practical course, a hands-on course where uh, uh, we would demonstrate to you, along with Mr. Day, um, practically translation of agoscopy on a volunteer and then you'd have the opportunity to practice uh, on each other if uh, you uh, if uh, for, if you have to volunteer uh, however due to the covid-19 pandemic uh, that has as you know been converted to a virtual uh, course and as such uh, that had to be taken out as, as well as the questions but uh, we will try to cover in depth the, the technical aspects, which is what this course is meant to be. Uh, guide you in terms of what you should be looking for, uh, normal anatomy as well as uh, cone pathologies and how to recognize and deal with them and finish off with some take home messages. So without further ado, just starting with uh, the physiology. Uh, as you know, um, the upper esophageal sphincter, uh, primarily consisting of the cracopharyngeus muscle, is uh, a high pressure zone that controls um, the flow of the food bolus from the hypopharynx into the cervical esophagus and vice versa, uh, prevents reflux of contents from the esophagus up on, you know, to the laryngopharynx. On the contrary, uh, the lower esophageal sphincter uh, doesn't have a single distinct muscle that is responsible for it and uh, also changes its position uh, in terms of the respiration phases that a patient is and that can uh, change by up to three centimeters sometimes. Um, its resting tones is between 15 and 45 millimeters of mercury and uh, as you know again it, uh, it, is, uh, the, uh, it al allows, when it relaxes, the passage of the food bolus from the distal esophagus into uh, the, gastro the stomach and uh, prevents the reflux of contents the other way around. Uh, I'm not going to go into de depth uh, with regards to pharyngeal swallowing. You're all familiar with this, but essentially uh, that consists of the glossopalatal junction uh, opening and uh, also the villopharyngeal junction closing uh, in order to prevent uh, nasal regurgitation of food and uh, the laryngeal vestibule also closes to prevent aspiration of uh, food into the airway and uh, the opening of the upper esophageal sphincter allows the passage into the alimentary tract i.e. from the hypopharynx into the esophagus. So let's look at some uh, pathologies and the concept of dual pathology uh, making TNO very relevant in our practice. So it's important to understand and um, that uh, unexplained throat symptoms can often, often be the first presentation of lower esophageal pathology. That is something that has been in the surgical literature for a long time. However, uh, more recently has appeared also in the ENT literature and that's very important to appreciate this. In other words, 
uh, many patients that may have serious disease in the distal esophagus, in, including adenocarcinomas, their first presentation may actually be non-specific uh, symptoms in the laryngopharynx. As you know, the best way to assess uh, any mucosal disease is endoscopically in order to be able to directly visualize and also uh, perform biopsies rather than other imaging modalities which have their role in different circumstances. But for early disease, uh, endoscopy, uh, mucosal disease endoscopy is uh, the optimal first investigation. So having said that, uh, as I said, there are recent ENT uh, papers. However, um, I will draw your attention to this landmark uh, paper from the surgical, general surgical literature from the Annals of Surgery in 2004 by Revis, where the, what they found is that laryngopharyngeal reflux symptoms are better predictors for the presence of uh, uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma compared to the classical, the typical gourd, the gastroesophageal reflux symptoms. And uh, you can see the, uh, in the table below, there's a variety of these symptoms. Uh, red and chronic cough, to hoarseness, aspiration, sore throat. So that's very important because obviously uh, the vast majority of these symptoms, if not all, are likely to present to an ENT slash head and neck clinic first. So if you look at this paper, what they uh, found, which is very interesting, is that uh, if you compare the esophageal with the upper respiratory symptoms for uh, gastroesophageal reflux and Barrett's, as you would expect, uh, the esophageal symptoms uh, predominate. However, uh, uh, when it comes to adenocarcinoma, which as you know, usually affects, uh, presents in the distal third of the esophagus, uh, actually, interestingly, the upper respiratory symptoms are more common initial presenting complaints. And I do stress that, and will stress again throughout this instructional course, uh, because uh, a lot of people may not realize this, and, uh, and that may result in uh, missing early diagnosis of esophageal cancer. Now, when we talk about reflux, uh, as you know, we've got the classical, the gastroesophageal reflux, uh, which you can see on the right side, which can lead to erosive uh, and inflammatory changes in the mucosa that I will discuss with you at a later slide. Uh, but this is primarily dealt with by our gastrointestinal colleagues. And then we've got the laryngopharyngeal uh, reflux, which is uh, a separate disease entity, uh, which we all are very familiar with, and uh, that has the classical features okay, uh, most times of the posterior laryngitis, interarytenoid edema, and erythema, and so on, as you can see on the left. So there's no reason why the two may not coexist, um, and that's very important. Now, uh, other common scenarios where TNO is useful is uh, the investigation of dinophagia. Um, um, we're not very good at uh, identifying the level at which uh, uh, there is a problem in the esophagus, and hence the problem I discussed with you earlier on about uh, uh, lower esophageal disease presenting with non specific uh, laryngopharyngeal symptoms. Similarly, a scenario here that we encountered a patient who uh, was referred with odinophagia, uh, seen by somebody else, a normal FNE, normal uh, head and neck examination, but actually when they were subsequently represented, they were uh, on TNO, they were found to have uh, esophageal candidiasis, which was further investigated. Uh, something that you would, you know, what I'm trying to say is that you would not pick up by the traditional uh, ENT slash head and neck examination, including the fibrodinous endoscopy in clinic. Adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma uh, of the esophagus, uh, as you know, has a male preponderance and uh, it's strongly linked to obesity. And as you know, we, are, we have been going on for many, many years now with a pandemic of obesity. And uh, as such, the uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma is rising and there are papers, uh, for example, one from 10 years ago in the BMJ, uh, showing that the UK uh, has the highest incidence in the world. And that's very relevant. The other point here, which uh, I keep reiterating, is that it very rarely presents early. It usually presents late with absolute dysphagia and other symptoms due to local or distant uh, spread of the disease. Um, and the reason being what I told you is uh, the 
poor ability to localize where the initial symptoms stem from. Um, again, if you look at the uh, adenocarcinoma, uh, as you know, it is uh, the lower third and lower esophagus, and this is the one that uh, is following a rise, is showing a rise over the years, as opposed to in the more proximal esophagus, different histological types. And uh, cancer research UK data here, you can see that uh, uh, age is a, a strong risk factor, and with increasing age, the, the rate of incidence is higher. Similarly, again, about half of them are distal third, and these are the adenocarcinomas as opposed to uh, SCC, squamous cell carcinoma, which commonly presents the more proximal esophagus, upper and middle thirds, which is a different disease biologically. And uh, if you look at solid uh, tumors, uh, you can see that the esophageal carcinoma is certainly rising. This is international data, all the references below for the different slides. And um, this needs to be uh, considered. So with all this in the background, you can already start appreciating the very important role of transnasal esophagoscopy in modern ENT head and neck practice. The other reason why TNO has a big role in uh, head, neck, and uh, ENT is because it, uh, the traditional tools have their own limitation problems. This relate uh, to assess the esophagus, I mean. This, the commonest, as you know, is uh, OGD, esophagogastroendoscopy, which is a fiber optic endoscope most commonly pr uh, performed by gastroenterologists and also by upper GI surgeons. But uh, the problem is that this uh, requires sedation, usually with uh, benzodiazepines, which in an aging population can lead to important uh, morbidity, uh, like cardiopulmonary complications, about one in 200, with half of them termed potentially serious. And also the mortality, though very low, is not negligible, and uh, depending on what you, with papers you look in the literature, uh, is about one in 2,000. On the other hand, if you look at the tools that we use to uh, perform endoscopies, uh, these primarily uh, are at present the fibrobinase endoscope, which is limited by primarily by its length. So it uh, pragmatically allows us to investigate down to the C6 level, just to above the carpharyngeus, uh, including the carpharyngeus. And although you are, it is possible to cannulate that and look at the proximal esophagus, uh, the problem is that uh, this uh, doesn't have an uh, insufflation port and uh, other additional tools that TNO has to give you a good view of this area. The other tool, of course, is rigid esophagoscopy, and although that does give you um, very good views, particularly difficult to see areas such as the hypopharynx, for example, uh, the problem is there that it does require general anesthetic. And uh, with the rigid instrumentation, there's of course a higher risk of perforation compared to OGD. So, in other words, the existing endoscopic techniques do have limitations and morbidity, and um, this is where TNO comes in. As I said, with the evidence I'm going to touch very, very superficially, more so just to give you a perspective from different countries and also patient perception. So, if you look uh, first of all here, from an American paper, uh, Howell et al. 2016. Uh, the evidence level generally is uh, relatively low. Uh, this one is uh, level evidence 2B, but a good number of patients, 329 in prospective design, multi-institutional. And essentially, uh, important findings here will is that over half the patients, 51%, the TNO resulted in a change in patient care, and that's important. More specifically, uh, what you can see is that uh, referrals to other specialties at the bottom of this table from that paper uh, uh, were not required in over uh, three quarters of these patients. In other words, these patients, uh, the three out of four patients were dealt with in that clinic. Uh, a diagnosis was uh, either made and acted on or uh, they were discharged as opposed to requiring other investigations, e.g. contrast swallows or refer to other specialists like gastroenterology in order to be further evaluated and reach diagnosis or exclude a diagnosis. Tumors were identified, which is a very important point here. You can see that. I've labeled this in yellow for you. And uh, of course, uh, you, with the TNO, you have the ability to also biopsy with the additional channel. 
and complications were extremely low. Look, uh, another paper from Turkey, also in 2016. Uh, again, uh, about 300 patients. And uh, the, well, here they looked more at patient uh, comfort or discomfort. They used visual analog score. And on the scale, you can see that the scores were very low. Uh, which um, is uh, what we also find in our clinical practice, that this is a procedure very well tolerated by patients and does not require an aesthetic, local anesthetic. Uh, morbidity, again, uh, very minimal. Only 2% of cases uh, reported epistaxis, which self-resolved and no major complications at all. And uh, you can also see perception of physicians of different parts of the procedure. Yeah, going to Asia now, a paper from Korea from 2014, 137 patients, prospective also. And uh, the point again is over a third of patients uh, had positive findings and there were no significant complications. So useful diagnostic tool and safe. And uh, if you look at the different indications, uh, you can see that uh, 102 of these patients uh, i.e. the vast majority of them uh, was for evaluation of uh, laryngopharyngeal reflux uh, disease. And that that's, goes back to the point I'm making, that uh, the patient may present with uh, symptoms there, but the pathology may actually be much, much further down and maybe serious pathology. If we uh, also finish with a paper from the United Kingdom, uh, Professor Paleri, 2014, uh, published largest uh, series here um, in this country, 257 patients. Uh, again, uh, uh, self-limiting and infrequent complications. Again, look at the indications and uh, at the top you will see unexplained throat symptoms. So I keep banging on the same concept because that's really, really important. And um, unfortunately many people don't realize how important that is that uh, unexplained throat symptoms may actually be the first presentation of esophageal adenocarcinoma. Also, important role in other situations beyond the common ones you would think of, like dysphagia, for example, or uh, lower gastrointestinal symptoms in terms of uh, surveillance and doing therapeutic procedures. I'll go in depth in a bit. Uh, if you look at the findings, uh, over half patients had no uh, abnormal disease and that actually is also very important because you are able to reassure the patient you're, uh, as you can record this you're able to show in your, uh, in your TNO MDT clinic the procedure or the salient points to the patient and reassure them and also this can provide the fact that you can record and go back to it can provide you if you're surveying something and uh, looking for a trend is it improving is it going is it persisting is it worsening uh, that is an excellent tool to do that, such as changes, for example, related to reflux in the lower esophagus. A majority of patients were discharged, 59%. And again, that uh, makes the argument that um, uh, the American paper also made in terms of um, the fact that you can deal with these patients in that sort of setting and minimize unnecessary referrals or further investigations and give the patient a diagnosis or be able to reassure them confidently. The American Bronchoesophagological Association uh, has uh, published a position statement on this. You can see the paper here. And essentially, uh, they also uh, recognize its value and the fact that the literature does support the equivalence of transnasal esophagoscopy to conventional esophagoscopy, which primarily relates to the OGD. Uh, and hence, they do acknowledge it as a useful tool. Now, uh, we discussed a lot about diagnostic uh, evaluation. How about uh, um, TNOs therapeutic tool? And yes, uh, there are many applications you can do. Strictures, a very common problem we encounter very frequently in our head and neck oncological practice, post radiotherapy strictures. Uh, or um, that you can balloon dilate that, you can do that in the clinic, you don't need theater, the patient doesn't need a GA, it's better for the patient, it's better for uh, the service, but, uh, and uh, as such may translate to improve uh, efficiency and costs. Uh, but also, as you know, there are patients, particularly those patients that have received uh, chemoradiotherapy therapy or uh, that may have problems uh, in terms of getting access with the rigid endoscopy, 
because of trisms, for example, or C-spine problems, and elderly patients you have often. So that allows you to perform that without a GA in the outpatient setting. And of course, you can repeat that. It's also a very valuable tool for performing secondary tract esophageal punctures. Again, uh, in our days, uh, the, major the majority of our, uh, the, an increasing number of laryngectomy patients, or laryngectomy procedures are for sal salvage laryngectomies following failure of uh, radiotherapy and or chemo radiotherapy. Uh, and as such, um, uh, these patients, as you know, we often uh, not perform a primary puncture and do that uh, at a later stage following the salvage laryngectomy. Again, you can do that with the help of a TNO in the outpatient setting without anesthetic, um, saving the patient a second GA. Plus, as you know, it can't be fiddly, the secondary puncture in these patients, and uh, it's easier with the fiber optic instrumentation and flexible instruments sometimes. Percutaneous gastrostomy can be performed with it, and also other applications like Botox, for example, injection, which uh, is something that we do, for example, for crack fire, into the crack fire induced, or you can do that to the distal esophagus for achalasia. And laser therapy, you can have fiber optic lasers, and that can be used, for example, for lasering papillomas and other pathologies. So there's a broad spectrum of therapeutic applications for TNO as well. You can see some examples here of balloon dilatations, secondary punctures, and uh, gastrostomies. So future directions. So what's important is having discussed all this, uh, um, another therapeutic application uh, could be for the management of uh, emergence as well, like esophageal food bolus, where of course this uh, has, uh, where conservative therapy has failed and the patient doesn't have any bone or bony fragments in there. Uh, that can be useful sometimes. And there are uh, also um, um, using uh, other uh, technological, uh, uh, more, more recent technologies, like for example, narrow body imaging, combining this with TNO, in order to be able to more, have more perform more targeted biopsies. And uh, the establishment of uh, multidisciplinary clinics, along with gastroenterology, with upper GI surgery, and uh, also for our own clinics, our Hellenic Oncology Clinics, for, sur uh, for surveillance of hernia cancer patients, you could uh, perform a uh, potentially even a pan endoscopy in the outpatient setting. And uh, the, I'm not, this is not part of this uh, particular instructional course, but uh, there's another one from our colleagues who have published on the subject and uh, I'm sure they will uh, discuss that. And also it's very useful as a screening tool, because as you know, uh, hernia cancer patients often have synchronous or metachronous uh, tumors, which you could pick up as well. So there is a very uh, there are a lot of applications for TNO. So let's now focus for, uh, on the actual uh, uh, main aim of this uh, instructional course, which is the actual technique, and make it as practical as possible in the context of the COVID pandemic and the uh, and the fact that now it's gone virtual. So, as I said, transnasal esophagoscopy is an important advance. There is a broad spectrum. Uh, the, the actual endoscope itself does have uh, a, an additional channel, uh, two millimeter channel, through which you can uh, uh, insert guide wires, uh, you can put your balloons, you, you can have suction, you have suction, you have insufflation, or many things that you don't have with your conventional fibrogenous endoscopes and no sedation is required for the procedure. Now, like with anything else, uh, the first thing to know is normal anatomy before starting talking about pathology. And uh, there are certain uh, basic concepts, uh, which is important for the ENT surgeon to familiarize, like uh, uh, which they, uh, which gastrologists are of course much more uh, accustomed to. So uh, recognizing the Z line, which essentially demarcates the squamous columnar junction of the esophagus between the squamous epithelium, which is uh, sort of white red, proximally, and uh, the columnar epithelium distally, which is more salmon pink. And uh, by recognizing the normal Z line, then you'll be able to see whether uh, changes of this, uh, the spreads of this columnar epithelium extending proximally, suggesting the presence of uh, esophagitis, barred esophagus, and so on. 
uh, also it's important to uh, combat allergies like hydrous hernia you can uh, you should be able to pick up now the but the key relates to esophageal adenocarcinoma and uh, the reason why this is useful is because as you know this disease usually uh, follows a, a well-known progressive stage from reflux to the chemical inflammation that results from it to chronic inflammation that will result in metaplasia from the squamous to the columnar epithelium dysplasia and you know eventually with a high-grade dysplasia carcinoma in situ and invasive carcinoma uh, and uh, this is where the key is to be able to pick up much, many more of those patients at the early stage when they present with their non-specific upper laryngopharyngeal symptoms, uh, perform a biopsy of that, be able to survey that, see is it responding to proton pump uh, inhibitors, and uh, if necessary, refer it accordingly in time for the patient to hopefully uh, have a curative option. Otherwise, as you know, the survival rate is very, very low because this disease not, uh, commonly presents late. Now, practical discussion. Uh, how do you prepare the patient for it? Well, uh, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, you have to consider this as a potentially aerosol-generating procedure. And as such, uh, full uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, should be uh, worn to minimize the risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection. With regards to the advice we give to the patients, we advise them to be kneeled by mouth for three hours and when they come to sip some carbonated water. Uh, when the procedure is about to start, sit them upright in a comfortable chair and uh, apply the local anesthetic. It is crucial that you're very generous with the local anesthetic application, both transnasally and transorally, to ensure adequate anesthetic is applied and give it enough time before you start doing anything. That applies, as you know, to any local and state procedure and it's crucial. You don't want to go on too early and reassure the patient uh, in the process that you won't be able to feel your throat. Uh, you may think that you can't swallow, you can't breathe, you can't, you just can't feel it. And because some patients, as you know, can get anxious. Uh, once you're ready, then you can start uh, doing some practice swallows and uh, start recording the procedure. Um, we usually ask the patient to uh, be chinned down to swallow the scope, but I will discuss. I will I will tell you specifically uh, different tricks to be able to cannulate the carpharyngeus and get in the cervical esophagus. Uh, during the procedure, we also ask them to sip on different at different times. This is with non-carbonated water. Usually, our speech and language therapy colleague, who is with us in the multidisciplinary disciplinary uh, clinic. Uh, holds a cup with a straw uh, on the mouth of the patient and you ask them to just sip water when you try to get the sphincter to open. And also that will clean the scope. Uh, as I said, you have suction, you have insufflation, and this may be useful in different parts of the procedure, especially when you're trying to open up a bit, a collapsed viscous, uh, such as the esophagus, to look at different areas. Now, the technique itself, the, of course, you get the scope ready, get the white balance and all the classical uh, initial um, settings. In terms of cannulating uh, the esophagus itself, there's two main ways to facilitate that. You can either, uh, when you are at the area just above the postcricoid area, you can ask them to burp and as the carpharyngeus will open, you enter the cervical esophagus that way. Or alternatively, you can ask the patient to tuck their chin towards the chest like this and you pass the tip above the arytenoids and you aim for the left piriform sinus and with gentle pressure, you can again intubate the esophagus that way. It's important when you manipulate the scope that not retroflex because obviously then you will lose your bearings. If for whatever reason you encounter excessive resistant intubation of the esophagus and you cannot advance the scope, uh, especially if you're not, uh, you haven't done the procedure many times, you're not comfortable, the best thing to do is probably consider abandoning the procedure at this stage and performing a uh, contrast swallow. The reason I say that, of course, is because you want to minimize the risk of perforating, which though extremely small is possible. And uh, common, uh, you know, there are many reasons why these things can happen. People can accidentally have entered a Zenger and not realize it when they're inexperienced, or they may be hypertonistic or whatever. So if you are having significant difficulty, uh, best to abandon it to minimize the complications. 
Um, so once you pass the endoscope uh, into the cervical esophagus and you cannulated it, then you will go down. And uh, with swallowing, the lower esophageal sphincter will also open. And by asking the patient to sniff, it also facilitates the assessment uh, to evaluate for the presence of a uh, high hernia. Uh, then you, you can go into the stomach. Now, the key once you go to the stomach uh, is that you want to inspect the whole stomach and you can also look at the duodenum. But the, the key here, first of all, is that uh, you have the, the knowledge for that. And that's why you should be spending some time if you're planning to start this service with gastroenterologists in their OGD clinics and get to do a few OGDs with them to recognize both the normal anatomy and the pathology. But uh, once you're in the stomach, uh, what you can do is you can suction it to be able to inspect the rugi and the mucosa all around. And uh, you also have the ability to retroflex, and that's important in order to be able to look uh, at the um, uh, gastric fundus. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, once you have finished with the stomach and you start coming out, the procedure hasn't finished. You are carefully inspecting the esophagus again and more carefully. In addition to the lower third, you, which you would have inspected uh, also uh, when you were going in, uh, particularly the middle and upper thirds to look for pathology there as well. And this is where insufflation can be useful to open it up. Um, retroflexion, I mentioned just a minute ago, uh, this uh, is very useful and important. By turning the scope 180 degrees, you'll be able to look at the fundus, you'll be able to look at the cardia from the other side. And essentially, uh, you will then be able to assess the stomach in its entirety. Otherwise, you would miss uh, a, a you may miss a proximal problem. What should you be looking for? Well, we've looked at some of the things, but uh, uh, we discussed about the Z line and uh, how the different epithelium looks uh, macroscopically. Uh, masses, of course, cancers. Inflammation, uh, the presence of ulcers, as you know, cancers can be not, are not all, always exophytic, they can be endophytic, and ulcers can actually be neoplastic. Uh, so again, with experience, you'll be able to pick things like that up. Uh, stenosis at different levels, and uh, Zenger diverticulum, and um, what is paramount, and I'm uh, reiterating it again, is normal anatomy. You need to be able to know normal findings, such as, for example, the natural areas of narrowing, which uh, as head and neck surgeons we're quite familiar with. You know, about uh, 50 centimeter, you'd expect to have the crack pharyngeus, but um, you need to know about the left bronchus and the aorta and where you would expect to see that, and obviously distally, uh, the diaphragm and lower esophageal sphincter. Again, this varies 38 to 40 centimeters and moves, of course, with respiration, particularly in the awake patient. So take home messages. Uh, patients with upper respiratory and digestive symptoms, uh, even if they have a normal head and examination, normal fibrosis endoscopy, may, uh, may actually have distal esophageal disease, and uh, you wouldn't be able to pick that up at the early stage unless you visualize their esophagus. Uh, TNO does not require sedation, and uh, as such is very safe and uh, has a uh, real benefits particularly as it can also be used as a therapeutic tool uh, you must must match the expertise uh, uh, of colleagues in other specialties like gastroenterology from a diagnostic perspective um, in order to ensure that you are actually not missing any pathology and that's why if you are planning to do that you should definitely spend a bit of time quite a bit of time and do some with the customer and do some OGDs with them supervising uh, and remember we are as head and neck and ENT surgeons are uh, usually the first people that will see those uh, uh, adenocarcinomas of the distal esophagus and many of them uh, uh, will be missed for the reasons of spend discussing and uh, it's crucial that we do this in a multidisciplinary setting involve your gastrointestinal colleagues involve your upper GI colleagues and uh, this uh, I hope that uh, have managed we have managed to give you the basics in terms of uh, why is that important what you can do and how to actually do it so if you're interested you can start uh, coming to units where they do it and also go to gastroenterologists to look at conventional OGDs. 
unfortunately, as I said, uh, the fact that it's virtual doesn't allow us to do any practical demonstration, but um, uh, this is something that uh, you can do at your uh, hospitals through the route I just said. And, uh, and, uh, um, and also, I hope I've given you a clear understanding in terms of why this is likely to play an increasingly important role in head and neck practice and ENT in the future. Thank you very much.